Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 2, Chapter 5, Sections 1 through 3, Yixing Zisha Or. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Hey, hey. And Zongjun Li. Hello. Hello, Pat. Hello, Zongjun. Yixing ore is formed from the weathering of rocks forming primary clay in the elevated plains of China, uplifted and carried by the Yangtze River until it was deposited, re-weathered, and compressed into sedimentary secondary clay in the basin of Taihu Lake. And yet, a similar story could be told for all of the secondary clay in China. So my first question, what is so special about Zisha ore? Well, first, I would say it's definitely the abundance of uh, kaolinite that's found in the Taihu region. And also, especially, you know, the uh, sediment layers that was a result of early, in the early days, Taihu being much larger. And, you know, all of the sediment layers mixed with the kaolinite underneath. And also the abundance of uh, mica chips in the mixture of uh, a lot of these layers due to, you know, um, early days aquatic lives. All of these results into a very unique composition of clay mixture that's not uh, as common to be seen in other regions. Even though in some regions we do see, you know, clay layers, clay structures similar to Yixing in some places like Henan, or even, you know, recently they found uh, a place in Taiwan that produce a uh, kind of similar zisha clay. But in such large quantity, abundance, and uh, quality, uh, Yixing is pretty unique. Being able to have such different types of ore within, you know, just somewhere between feet and meters of each other, right? I think that, that created an interesting ceramics culture where from our side as connoisseurs, right, you have these different ores coming from a similar region that have potentially different properties and interactions with tea, you know, create an, an interesting culture of, of pairing and connoisseurship. So I think having, having those layers is definitely one part of what makes Zusha unique. I would also posit it the other way that it may not be specifically the ore itself that has caused Zusha to be so special, but the culture that has surrounded it and built up around it. I think, yes, there is something to the clay. You know, there, there must be a reason we, we all do tangibly see these interactions as positive for the most part with tea. But I really think it's, it's the culture and the history that is built up around it, as well as the mythology, which we've, we've touched upon in earlier discussions, um, that has led Zusha to be, you know, the, the go-to clay for tea ceremony. That's a very interesting point. The point that maybe it's not just the clay alone, it's that the tea and the clay had a, a historical set of interactions and traditions that led to each refining each other. What do, what do you make of the argument on that line that maybe a better clay exists somewhere out there in the world? Because if so, first question is why haven't we found it? And that argues against the idea of this, uh, this, this mutual uh, evolution, this, uh, how do you say, symbiotic historical relationship between Yixing and Ting. Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. I, I do think that if not at the moment now, at some point in the future, it's very possible that either a totally natural or partially synthetic or totally synthetic brewing material will come along that is superior to Zusha. But I think we have to address superior in what way, right? Will it make all teas taste better? What is better, right? So I think the culture, the history, the narrative that surrounds Zusha, beyond just the direct tangible sensory impacts has, has a larger phenomenological effect on the tea practice that even if there were aware that um, was substantially and objectively better in certain properties, uh, I don't know that it would be widely and immediately adopted versus Zusha because of the phenomenological impacts tied to the history and culture that has surrounded Zusha and tea as they've grown together over the last you know few centuries. Yeah, I want to second to the first part of your um, argument, uh, Patrick. So the definition of what's, you know, the best clay for tea, I think uh, it's defined in both ways, right? Like uh, people appreciation of good tea is uh, to a lot of levels acquired taste. And that was trained and acquired based on, you know, what they have been exposed to. So, you know, zisha 
being the the first and the most wide recognized clay materials made for teapots, were definitely the first exposure for a lot of tea drinkers to you know a better quality or sometimes a superior quality tea tea vessels. One way to look at it is just: Do you think that people who predominantly were raised brewing with chaozhou, you know, red clay teapots, do you think yeah. they believe Zusha is better, or what, what's yeah, their thoughts? I don't, I don't know. That was my second thought because you know in Chaoshan region people use、uh, Chaozhou Hongni to to make teapots to brew Dantong, which you know I think that will、um, further confirm our、uh, first argument is that you know people frequently you know acquired the definition of what's good clay, what's、uh, the most suitable type of clay for a specific type of tea, tea based on their you know exposure. Yeah, it goes back to what we discussed in in the first book, right around. Inculturation, and I think our discussion of、uh, what is good now. Certainly, if you are interested, please revisit the first book. Just to summarize this argument, the argument is that not only does yixing the materials, zisha the material, have a positive effect via its interaction with tea, but that the tea makers themselves, due to exposure to yixing material, actually produce tea that is best paired with yixing. We see wuyi that is made specifically to be brewed in yixing. We see some dansongs or some other high roast taeguan yins or anxi oolongs that are best made. For yishik, so that so there is a symbiotic relationship where these feed off of each other, and even if there's some proverbial ambrosia forming material out there, right, it doesn't have the aesthetic culture, it doesn't have the acculturation, and it doesn't have the products that go best. It's like trying to use a copper pot for Italian food based on tomatoes; you're going to poison yourself. Very much so. I think that summarizes the argument. Additionally. It's possible that there is a world in the future where a better material is introduced, but it would be interesting to see how that's introduced. Is it introduced as a commercial interest? Is it a branded solution? Where, if we think about like Lins Pure Ion, right, or, or is it going to be something that is coming from、uh, the culture, right? Tea practitioners and ceramicists who start to promote a specific type of ware from a specific region. I'm sure we'll see it in the future. Hopefully, we're all we're all there to be a part of it. I, I'm less convinced. I'm less convinced. If, if we think about this, you know, historically,、uh, we have we have multiple regions in China that, that have、uh, histories of ceramic production. We have the imperial kilns in Jingzhen,、uh, where Jingzhen clay and and blue and white clay has fallen heavily for teapots has fallen heavily out of favor. We see everyone using gaiwans versus teapots if they're not using yixing. South Korea,、um, we see very very little competitive. Teapot making Japan, we see some、uh, kusus and other types of brewing vessels, but generally we don't see highest level practitioners using it. Where where is the competition, right? What if if there is ceramic material out there that can produce competitive wares? Why haven't we found it? If that's an argument that it's going to be a synthetic material,、um, I, I I think there's likely an uphill battle for it to be accepted. Yeah, overall, I, I agree with you. I, I think it, it it will not be in our lifetime. That's for sure. Beyond just the actual positive interaction that we see, I think the phenomenological and aesthetic culture surrounding teapots and tea, specifically zusha, not going to go away anytime soon. But I would like to、uh, maybe elaborate that argument that I would say certain engineering of clay. Has already been exist. You see a lot of、uh, ceramists doing、uh, clay blending, blending certain types of clay together to reach to different level of performance regarding on you know shippability、um, or in- decrease crackage rate or just purely for aesthetic purpose like Telsha. I think clay blending is well within the the realm and art of of yixing.、Right? Uh, blending different ores, blending finished clays has, has long history and also cer- across ceramic arts. I don't think of that as separate. From the historical or the traditional art form, agreed. So, okay, furthering this, thinking about what makes Zisha special, has this chapter or、uh, and the new knowledge in this chapter influenced what you look for in a Yixing teapot? Well, to me, it definitely raises up the attention of addition into clays to reach different characteristic. For example, for certain materials like barium or、uh, you know iron oxide、uh, being added into the original ore to reach to a different color after the sintering is done. 
frequently we see people referencing a piece of bright green color tea-wares and calling it a loony,、uh, but it's really a result of addition of、um, certain chemicals into the the original ore and original. Luni ores are frequently, you know, yellow or pale gray in color, and the end firing of raw luni ore is frequently darker color, yellow, sometimes similar to honey. What this chapter really showed me, and I guess I was very interested in the、uh, undesirable additive section, but I I don't think it provided me anything that I will look to further in selecting yishings. I think what it showed me was how little I understand about the makeup of yishings. So I think what it really helped me do was circle back with kind of the last chapter and form a, a greater framework in my head of how you know these teapots from a tangible standpoint come to be. And I think that's something that, as as a lover of tea, I've looked a lot at the history of Yixing, and of course we went through that together、um, with the past couple chapters. But this was an area of knowledge that was just completely missing from me before, and so I think I'm still wrapping my head around it. And we'll have to see. Time will tell how it helps me to either select or understand yishings better in my practice. I, I entirely agree. I see this as the psychophysics of taste, or the psychophysics of aesthetics, versus the aesthetics、uh, and the the taste itself.、Uh, you know, when when the scientific media. I don't know if everyone reads the same media that I do, but when the media. Blairs like new taste bud discovered, new new protein receptor site on the tongue discovered, and everyone's like, "How will this change the way that people taste?" The answer is, "Well, it will change absolutely nothing. Everything that you tasted yesterday will taste the same today, knowing that there's some new protein receptor site, right?" So that's the psychophysics, right? What is the what is the the the, the mechanics of the uh, stimuli uh, and the tongue? And so I see this much the same way. I don't I don't think this changes. When I look at a yishing and say, "Is this a good yishing? Is this a bad yishing? Is this a yishing we're going to I'm going to acquire for the collection?、Uh, is this a yishing that I'm going to pair with X, Y, or Z T?" I don't think that this changes anything. Or if it does, I don't yet understand what it changes. What it what it, but what it does right is it gives me a causal mechanism for for what that clay is in a in a way that I didn't have before. This was an area that I that I had very little understanding. Before writing this chapter, and I mean, we started writing this book more than a year ago. This is well more than a year of study in order to get to this point.、Uh, but I still think that, as for application, I, I, I don't know if this changes what what I do or what I decide to do. I mean, I think we'll have to see,、uh, you know, what further chapters elucidate、um, as you start to cover things like the topology of of the teapots and the different. Structures that are found within post-firing,、uh, and how that's influenced by the different compounds within the teapot.、Um, I think maybe this knowledge will start to solidify, but it's also possible that this is still a working field of knowledge where you know nobody truly knows the answers, and that's that's got to be okay too.、Uh, I I think I agree with that. You know, there's there's the three competing theories that we started to talk about on the last podcast. Whether is it heat retention and that the clay itself has no effect? Is it Uh, porosity, which everyone talks about, that that's interacting with tea, or is it surface texture, or is it some combination of the above?、Uh, as we get results back on our tea pairings, as we get results back on、uh, clay porosity and other physical attributes, we'll be able to start running statistical tests on these and start regressing which of these things have an effect. And once that framework is built up, or as that framework is built up throughout the publication of the rest of the book, I think that. This type of foundational knowledge will become much more clear in its application. I also think this foundational knowledge is interesting. Looking at it from our perspective as practitioners, I know that much of the knowledge in this field is still being,、um, you know, heavily researched from a, a scientific side, right?、Um, particularly in China, I think there's still quite a lot of research being done, right, on yishing teapots. It would be interesting to understand from you know the the side of either craftsmen or like application scientists how in the future as they learn more about you know specifically the compounds within yishing ore and how it's affected by firing as that field continues to progress how you know specific compounds might be altered or engineered to either meet specific outcomes or in our case right to improve. Uh, the quality of certain brews of tea or certain aspects of tea and the interactions within. So, when you mentioned taste, right, and taste receptors, 
it was interesting because where my mind went to was yes, the how you taste is not going to change, but how people in the food industry develop food, knowing that there is, you know, new taste receptors, which can be blocked or excited more, the food that you are eating may be changed. Uh, and so it's possible that, you know, as this field progresses, the teapots may be changed uh, and how that affects our practices is yet to be known. Yeah, definitely. So for, for our own experiment, which uh, it's maybe a little bit out of the scope for this podcast, we'd start testing a certain processing method or uh, clay types and with res its respect to uh, the tea quality or tea perception. So for some techniques such as Wu Hui or Tiao Sha, uh, what used to be widely recognized as for more of the aesthetic purpose, and we are still trying to uh, understand how it will impact on the flavor of tea. This is this is a tricky question that I'm sure we will circle back to in, in future podcasts and in our uh, experimental sessions. But how confident are you if I presented you with a teapot that you would be able to identify Yixing or not Yixing? Yixing or not Yixing, I, I am decently confident. Uh, I am a scientist, so decently confident means, you know, 70%. I think seven, seven out of 10, I could get. If if you're gonna go further and further into subtypes, this is where that number might go down. Yeah, I would probably say the same thing. I mean, like flavor profiles coming from uh, Yixing versus uh, a Gaiwan is certainly uh, pr pretty obvious in most of the time, but uh, I think I will have trouble telling apart from a Yixing versus a Chaoshan. Um, sometimes that gets a little tricky for me. Oh, you're answering a much more interesting question, Zongjun. I was talking about presenting a teapot and saying, is this Yixing, is this not Yixing? You're talking uh, about blind, blind tasting, saying, is this Yixing, is this not Yixing? I, I, I think it's much stronger than Pat's. I thought, I thought that's, uh, that's the question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think hands-on, right? Just my hands and my eyes. I, I think, obviously, I've seen many tricky exceptions. Uh, so maybe that's why I'm a little less confident, but uh, decently confident in the hands-on approach. I think blind tasting sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> I know if I see them, I can I can definitely tell the difference. You know, I can see where the tea has been affected by the material it was brewed in. But um, just completely blind, not knowing what the tea was brewed in, it'd be very hard for me to say specifically what material I think uh, you know was used as the brewing medium. Zongjun, do you want to moderate your claim because I'm going to test you later? <laughs> Just from the appearance of teapot, I think, um, you know, teapot authentication is like a field of expertise. I would probably be able to tell apart, uh, you know, fake versus real Yixing if I randomly walk into a, you know, a, a, a Tianren tea, tea shop uh, with a, an array of uh, rainbow color teapots sitting on the shelf. But, uh, you know, for some of the legit fakes, they, they can reach to pretty realistic imitation of real Yixing. For those, um, you know, maybe I'm not there yet. <laughs> well, I'm still, I'm still more, most interested, right, in, in, in the idea of the Yixing material. Like, do I think that I could identify a majority of, of Hongni and Juni and Zini? Yeah, I, I, I think that I can. Do I think that I can identify Yixing, not Yixing, when it starts to come to, to more esoteric clays, Luni and Duani? Mm, I don't know. Um, some, some of those are, are pretty different. And now doing the research on the developments of various Yixing ores and having seen examples of, of, of pure Baini, white clay, Yixing teapots, like if I was presented with the, the speckled white clay, and is, had to say, is this Yixing, is this not? I, I don't know if I could do it. If I saw a white stoneware teapot, I would immediately say not Yixing. So I, I'm not even aware of the existence of Baini. <laughs> Next chapter. And also people frequently confuse Luni being green color, but raw Luni with no addition of cobalt looks pretty similar to a lot of Duani wares. Yeah, very yellow. Yeah. Okay. This, this is an interesting conversation that I'm sure we're going to reference back in a couple of future chapters. Now, moving on back to the material science of this and, and how our concept of Yixing has changed and Zisha Or has changed through the information gained in this chapter. Uh, we discussed in the last chapter the definitions of vitrification, vitreous, and vitrified. 
How does the understanding of those related terms yield insight into the properties that you look for in a Yixing teapot? I think at a more tangible level, the conversation around, you know, vitreous versus fully vitrified, right? Um, definitely got me thinking about firing levels uh, and where if we are looking for a material impact to come from our Yixing, there is probably a certain degree of firing uh, that you want to be mainly hovering within for teapots that you're going to use. We have purposely acquired some overfired Yixings and we're still doing quite a lot of testing, but um, understanding from a textural, visual, and uh, obviously, of course, application standpoint, how well the teapot is fired, hopefully before purchasing, uh, is something that was uh, well solidified, I think, by this chapter as well. So the, the addition of the context from the previous chapter and then looking at what materials are um, forming melt, what materials are, you know, helping to uh, form melt that's closing pores, what materials are refractory and certainly not melting, right? That conversation, I think, came to a peak through reading the material in this chapter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like temperature is not just the single factor of that impact vitrification, right? Without vitrifiable content in the clay, we're just cracks. So like with the control of the, uh, the quantity of feldspar and a few other vitrifiable ingredients in the clay, I think we will be able to have a better understanding of what's the vitrification level with respect to a, a two-thron impact from a temperature and also ingredient level. And I think in the English speaking kind of Yixing world, I haven't seen the conversation of meat and bones, uh, at least I, I have yet to come across it. Um, this was an interesting framework, I think, to approach, you know, how certain materials are forming uh, the structure of your teapot. That was going to be my next question. Can someone define the concept of meat and bones? The bones are the usually unvitrifiable content and also the, uh, what people frequently perceive as the, the heart, the, uh, the crystal inside the clay, like quartz, like, you know, certain ingredients that people frequently call as sha. I think we, in the later chapter, we will be translating sha as grains. So all of these are frequently considered to be the bone of uh, the sha clay. Bone usually contributes to the sandiness of the clay. You know, clay with higher bone level are usually less shapeable and the shrinkage rate is less, meaning the tea wear will be retain its uh, structure better after sintering. And the meat is the more clay-like uh, materials in the, you know, in the sha. So with more meat, you can reach more delicate shapes of the wares during making. You'll be able to have better shapeability, but frequently it costs more shrinkage during firing and sintering. I think I got the phrasing backwards. I think you wrote it as bones and meat in the book, but yeah, I, I don't think I have much to add on to what Zongjun said, right? I, I think reading this helped me form at least the framework of things like the molite crystals from quartz and alumina forming the solid structure where uh, many of the other materials you mentioned in the chapter help to form that melt, right? In some, some degree of um, vitreous and to potentially vitrified depending on the firing, which forms up the, a lot of the interaction I think that's happening between the tea liquid and the tea bond itself. Well, that, that's a great segue into the follow-up question, right? So we, we have this conceptual framework of bones and meat, right? It's not real bones, it's not real meat. It's, it's a mix of the refractory material and the crystalline melt material. So what, what's the application of the theory? What, why do collectors use the theory? I would think a, a higher degree of melt material would mean to some degree a larger interaction between tea liquid and the interactable parts, right, of, of a teapot. When I think about the bones, I think of that as material that is um, structural or stabilizing and probably not having a large influence upon the actual interactions between tea and teapot. And uh, oftentimes we would see this reference being used to identify the uh, clay composition, uh, especially for a certain type of clay, you would uh, frequently have uh, nen and lao, so like the tender version and the, you know, old version, more uh, condensed version, which is frequently a lower layer um, of that specific clay. Um, usually uh, lao ni uh, contains more uh, bones and the ni contains more meat. Is one more desirable than the other? No, 
not really. <laughs> it's uh, the, the end performance uh, of Nen and Lao uh, varies depending on the clay type. Case, case by case basis. My last question. Did this chapter cover any misconceptions about Yi Qing or Zisha Or? Were there any misconceptions you were trying to uh, highlight? Were there any misconceptions I was trying to highlight? I think the biggest misconception that trips uh, a lot a lot of very intelligent people up is looking at chemical structure. And we, we, we had touched on that. We talked about that in the last chapter. But I think this chapter is even more clarifying that you can say, oh, it's uh, Fe203 and think that that's the end of the story because of the combination of iron in various forms in various uh, ionic states and uh, then its interaction with the rest of the material. And so thinking in terms of that type of chemical structure instead of physical structure and instead of thinking of clay as a metamaterial, right, thinking that you can look at individualized components, I, I think is the biggest uh, conceptual barrier. And it it makes it very hard to understand because it means that you have to it, right this 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 the last two chapters particularly right I don't have a uh, previously didn't have a background in in material science or, or or ceramics it really required multiple rounds of saying what you know what are what are these things what are these components and then how do these components interact and how does that interaction form new components and how do those components interact and what do you finally wind up with as a stable material and so. You know, so frequently you say, okay, well, there's this is in there, this is in there, this is in there, but it's in there in multiple forms and different different compositions and different physical properties, which form these other things which interact in these ways. And so I think that that was the the biggest takeaway that that there's nothing so simple as saying, oh, well, the high iron is what gives it a a, a, a ring in color. The high iron is why it's higher fired, or the certain type of iron is what causes uh, black core and black bone syndrome, those, those types of things. There's, there's no simple explanations where a single compound in the metamaterial is, is going to be the, the exclusive root cause of it. It all has to have to work in concert or, it, or form those various flaws in concert. Right. I think definitely the last chapter in this one helped me to look at Yishin more as the system, right? And uh, as you said, a metamaterial. Because I think if we we looked at it as each compound having a discrete effect, the only way to truly understand Yixing would then at that point to be to try every single combination of every potential range of compounds, which is uh, one, uh, probably an expensive way to go, <laughs> but two, a uh, very long road uh, to, to learning. Whereas I think understanding it as a system helps you see that all the materials, all the parts move together uh, and I think it's understanding and trying to capture where uh, the material sits at maybe larger uh, milestones will help you to form your application and mental framework um, as you start to apply the knowledge within these chapters to your brewing practice. And I think it really brings back to uh, the origin of uh, Zisha being an umbrella name of all types of, you know, Asian clays, right? Like people frequently referencing Zisha uh, as the purple clay, but it's really just Zini. And on the Zisha, you have all kinds of, you know, other clays like Luni, Hongni, uh, uh, Juni, Tianqingni. And being looked at it from a, you know, chemical composition level uh, really help us to uh, have a deeper understanding of all of these clay being, you know, similar in nature, but varies in uh, performance. I think it's a pretty uh, good framework uh, moving forward. It's good to know your previous conceptions of Yixing are wrong. I think it's good to live in that wrongness for a little bit and try and slowly take on this, this approach of having a system that is too complex to immediately understand and slowly take the step into the lifelong journey of trying to understand bit by bit what makes Yixing special. Oh dear, just wait till we get to the specific play sections. <laughs> well, everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, The Minds of Yixing. <laughs>